Hello and welcome to another Rich Chang's S Square Theatre Podcast with my guest today, David Badiou. Um And if you enjoy these podcasts, why not come and support me live? I am going to be on at the Edinburgh Fringe very imminently if you're watching this shortly after it has been released. Uh, I am at... Um, oh no, it's gone away. I'm at the Pleasance One. I don't need to look that up. At 7.30 uh, from the 2nd of August to the 26th of August. Every single day. Big venue. Book tickets now. Uh, and I'm also doing three Edinburgh Fringe podcasts at the Grand Hall at the Newtown Theatre on the 4th, 11th and 18th of August at 13.50. Um, that is a time. Uh, and uh, I thought those were Saturday afternoons. They're Friday afternoons. It's a big room again. But book ahead and come and see me. It's going to be fun. Anyway, go to richchang.com slash gigs and you can see all the info about those or if you're in the future about what gigs I'm doing now or if you're in the far future, just my obituary will be there. Okay, hopefully the very distant future. Let's watch Richard Hang's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who for the last two days has fallen asleep at two o'clock in the afternoon, but not today, so he might fall asleep during the podcast. It's Richard Herring! <laughs> hello, hello. How are we doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Should have killed me last year. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming along. Welcome to Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. I was talking to Dappy from N Dubs <laughs> today. He's quite depressed. Uh, he was in prison. Uh, and uh, he calls it rehearsal. I don't, I don't know if that's going to catch up. Uh, so, yeah, I've been having afternoon naps. I'm very, I'm so old. Uh, I've turned 50. I'm getting very, uh, getting very busy. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been awful. i uh, just having a, having a horrible child to look after. It's, uh, getting, getting up early. She's nice, actually. The other day, um, I, put my, I put like three pounds down on the sofa, just in my pockets, and she went, she went up to it and grabbed it and went, money. Uh, just like, sort of, golem. Uh, so she said, money. She's only two and a bit. She knows what it is. And she knows what it's for. And she took it and she put it in the little top, cute little top pocket. I mean, this was very much a kind of metaphor for how our life is going to be. The very pretty said, no, mine, mine. She really is doing this whole golem thing. I said, all right, fine, you can have it. What are you going to spend it on? And she said, she thought for a second, then said, biscuits. Uh, so she's uh, definitely my daughter. I have all the things, I mean, she, could, she doesn't know money, what value money has. For her, for her, three pounds might be enough to buy a yacht, from, as far as she knows, but biscuits, biscuits. That's what she would like, and that's what I would like as well. If I had unlimited money, I would just buy biscuits. Um, what does that say there? Oh yeah, that's why I'm going to introduce him. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, I was slightly depressed. I mean, it's been it's been depressing living in West London recently, anyway, for various reasons. Uh, but I was I was very depressed uh, walking down Wood Lane the other day and seeing uh, BBC TV Centre is uh, being taken apart and turned into flats. It just feels like a ter you know terrible tragedy. That meant so much to me in my childhood, seeing Roy Castle tap dancing around that fountain, and then I, that's where I, I you know I couldn't believe how lucky I was to work there in the 1990s. Uh, never again since then. Uh, and, uh, it's sort of just awful to see. It's just, it's just symbolic of a lot of stuff that's happening in London, especially the other side of the Westfield uh, is the Grenfell Tower. And you can see that it's almost a mirror image of these two, these affluent people on one side and this, the poverty of London and the disgrace that's happened on the other side. Uh, but, you know, it's nice to know that people are going to buy some flats uh, in TV Centre. And I wonder if they say this is the flat in which Jimmy Savile abused those kids. They, this, is the, this is where... Do you want to have that? Do you want, would you like to live in that flat or would you prefer one of the others? It's a way, it's a little trick we've got of finding out whether we should send you to prison. So anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my guest uh, tonight. He's probably best known, and I don't remember this myself, so I'm going to find out if this is true, as playing the character Mark Allen in This Morning with Richard Not Judy. No memory of that. At all. Uh, and do remember that David No Deal is better than David Baddiel. Uh, it's. Which works better when, when you say David Baddiel like my dad does. It's David Baddiel, ladies and gentlemen. Here he is. Here he is. David No Deal's better. Guess we've got David No Deal. Because he's better. He's better. 
Come in, put, you have to pick up a mic. Uh, come in, come on in. It's, you're sitting on it. Nice. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right, yeah. How are you? Yes. I noticed you said you fell asleep at two o'clock. Yeah. You know, I do that a lot. Do now. you? Yeah, constantly yeah. falling asleep. <laughs> Any time of the day or night, like Grandpa Simpson. Yeah. When I was younger, I didn't really understand why Grandpa Simpson <laughs> did that, but now I do. It's horrible, though, because you fall into a very deep sleep. Very it's... deep and troubling sleep. <laughs> yeah. Where you expect to wake up as an enormous beetle. Yes. I've noticed. Yeah. Well, I, I woke, one of the times I woke up and I could hear my wife downstairs. Like, oh, my wife's got up early to do the... To bring up to get the baby up, and then it was six o'clock in the evening. And so really? Yeah. So I was really confused about what what was. You've happening. married quite a young woman though, like an old showbiz person, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> You're like Des O'Connor age in that respect. Age is, <laughs> age is just a number. Because you, because Richard used to be a bit of a shagger in the old days. You know, he was talking about the invisibility cloak guitar. In the old days, unbelievably, Richard was a bit of a shagger, uh, and then eventually, what's good about that? is that you can sort of wait until you're far too old for anyone to actually have sex with you and yeah. then think, oh, I'll find the one who will. Yeah. And she'll be quite young. Well, I got my wife just at the exact right moment, just when I was just, just seemed to she, be still attractive. Just when she'd given up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and then I was looked all right. She thought she'd got a deal and then bang. Yeah. Oh, bang, it was oh, a bad deal. <laughs> there was no deal was better than a bad deal for your wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean she'd shag me? Um, I'm trying to work out if she would. No, that no, joke. no deal would be better than no that. No deal would be better than that, David, okay. David, no deal, look out for him. Uh, so, uh, do you remember being in This Morning, Richard, not you? I was never in that, what are you talking well, about? It's on your IMDB page and it says the character Mark Allen, it's like <laughs> A-double-L-A-double-N, it's a very specific... Oh, character. It's, it's Were you an anagram of my name, is it? Mark Allen, no. Anagram anal, not anal. I mean, if I was trying to add stuff to my IMDB page because I'm desperate for my career to look a bit better. That is the last place I would go. It's very specific to name a character. I think yeah. it might have been in the ironic review or something like that in the background or something. No, I was not in it for fuck's sake. You're honestly. nearly in I was like never don't remember in you it. being in it. In the um, old days, yeah. uh, some of you may remember this, Newman and Badil were the new rock and roll, uh, and we were like the Beatles, and uh, Lee and Herring were like Freddie and the Dreamers. <laughs> They were basically the shit ones, that's what I'm saying. So I wouldn't have done it. I'd have thought, I can't go near them. It'd we be asked embarrassing. You to be, we asked to be in Fist of Fun, yeah. and you couldn't do that either. That's uh, definitely that. You're going to be in this, the sketch about when Jesus comes knocking on the door, and then there's a bald man, and there's people asking for money, and then just increasingly straight. I'm not bald. No, it wasn't for you. Oh, and, right. then, and then at the end, it, come, it was going to come in, there would be loads of people, and you go, hello, oh, it's David Vadil. go, hello, I'm David Vadil. I do a lot of work with the disenfranchised. <laughs> um, for some reason, we found that really funny. No, it's uh, funny. And, uh, <laughs> It's quite funny. You can do it to Annabelle Giles the next day. But hang on, why didn't I get that gig? Because you couldn't do it. You wanted to. Because I was too busy being Mark Allen. <laughs> Mark Allen, <laughs> yeah. double A. Oh, I'm glad you went in it because I thought my mind's really going if I can't remember that. Anyway, let's ca crack on with uh, the podcast, the old podcast we're doing. Yeah. That's what, that's, let's, we don't want to talk about the past. Let's talk about the present, the near present. Uh, so, that's uh, not why anyone's come. Okay. <laughs> so you and Rob Newman met up recently. <laughs> Actually, that is true. Yeah. yeah uh, a sort of strange thing happened, which I was doing. I'm doing a show at the moment. Uh, I'm not doing it right at the moment, but I was doing a show uh, in the West End called My Family, Not the Sitcom, which is a show about my family. And. Uh, Really oddly, Rob Newman, who I don't really see, I have bumped into him about five times since we split up very badly in the 1990s. But, you know, it's, it's been fine. But then suddenly he tweets me, and I don't think Rob quite understands Twitter, because he tweeted me, can I have two comps for your show? <laughs> right, and I think he thought it was the private direct message bit, because what happened immediately was that loads of people started taking the piss out of him <laughs> for begging for tickets for my show. Uh, and so anyway, he did come, and he was very, very nice about it. Good. Which I thought he might not be, but he was. Yeah. He was lovely about it. It's nice. What he did say was that he couldn't come backstage. Oh, really? Yeah. He said he had to go and look after his child. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's fair enough. It's fair enough, but I thought it might be a lie. <laughs> well, the show, we're talking of the show My Family, not sitcom. Is it about your family or the sitcom? The family, <laughs> yeah. My family. It's, about, it's a show about my family. Yeah, okay. The with, sitcom. Yeah, with Robert Lindsay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Robert Lindsay has been to see it, actually. Has he? <laughs> yeah, he's been to see it. He was a bit confused. Uh, uh, no, yeah, it's a show about my family. Yeah, it's really good. I've seen it uh, two times. T twice, even. At least, at least two times. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, um, Thank you. It's we're you know I know you've talked about this a lot but it's it's as a comedian it's quite interesting and I think we we have as we're, we're similarly very honest I think in our work and in our lives because we sort of can't stop ourselves being yeah. I think no, you so is, more than me that is true is that people the show if anyone hasn't seen it 
is a show about my parents, primarily. My mum died in 2014 and my dad's got dementia. And the primary idea of the show, really, is that when people die, or indeed when they get dementia, we start talking about them like they're fucking angels. Like, we start talking about them like they're one... Like, at my mum's funeral, I had all these people come to me and tell me that she was wonderful. And the thing that bound all the people together who were saying that was they didn't really know her. It was very clear to me. I thought, you've never met her. You've no idea who the fuck she was. Uh, and the thing is, my mum was mental. I mean, completely fucking mental. And the main thing in my mum's life was that she was obsessed with golf. And the reason that she was obsessed with golf is that she had a long-term affair with a golfing memorabilia salesman. And I thought, no one's mentioning this at the funeral. It's completely being left out. And, and that bothered me, because I thought, well, this isn't the woman who I know, right? And I don't want to erase her out of existence with the idea that she was wonderful. So I started doing a show which details exactly what happened uh, when my mum fell in love with the golfing memorabilia salesman yeah. and also about my dad's dementia. But here's the interesting thing about that, I think, is a lot of people, when they were reviewing that show or talking about that show, were saying it was brave. It's not brave. I'm basically emotionally incontinent. And I want to tell people all the time the most embarrassing, vulnerable stuff about me. Yeah. I feel much happier doing that than, than, than not doing it. You know, a lot of people, I think, in, have this idea of the British yeah. as being like not wanting to talk about that stuff. But what they aren't thinking about is the Jewish, right? <laughs> the Jewish want to tell that stuff all the fucking time. Yeah. Men as well, because men are supposed to not be able to, to express their emotions. That's not true about Jewish men. They're always expressing their emotions, as far as I can make out. So I, so I never thought that was the brave part of it. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting. And I, I also think with all those, any show in which you open your, you know, your life up and your heart up a little bit, Everyone in the audience will have not exactly the same thing. My mum, for example, never, never had, had an affair, affair with, with a golfing member of the <laughs> As far as be I know, fucking amazing if she had. It would almost definitely be half brothers if she had. <laughs> but uh, she does like golf, though. So now you oh, got really? me thinking. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> did one day she suddenly start to like <laughs> golf? Right. I don't yeah, anyway. uh, but you know we've all got we've all got those skeletons in the, the closet, and you know we've all got stuff. I think you know that you feel like when I did Talking Cock, which wasn't a personal show, but wasn't was about it? well, it wasn't about me. Particularly. It was about you know because it was a, it was a lot of people's experience. But loads of times, like, like a big burly man would come back into the into the venue after it's closed. Oh, I've left my cigarettes here. Is that? I was glad I'm not the only one who's uh, yeah. <laughs> snapped his banjo string or whatever it was. Right. Uh, and what, then walk what, out. Again. What does that mean? Um, well, you know, on the underside of your penis. I've you? got a different penis to you. Uh, do you think you've still got this bit? Have I? I don't want to get him I out. Hope, I, I hope really so. don't want to get him out. But I mean, I should know. I'm worried, the... I'm worried that a circumcised penis might not have the I banjo think it does. string. I think it does. Does what? anyone. Has anyone. Oh, someone's put their hand up. Yes, yeah, someone's put their hand up. Yeah, I don't think. You circumcised you got a bad I don't think yeah, they but you might be a country and western star. <laughs> <all right now. laughs> I don't think they could take it. It's the very, it's the most sensitive part of the penis. Is okay, I've got sense. a sensitive part. It's definitely. on the underside, and it would connect the. But it sort of connects the glands the bit, the, yeah. to not even the foreskin to but sort of the foreskin. Not to the foreskin. Whatever, no. whatever yeah. else. Well, not to, for you to yeah, the foreskin. To the head. Yeah, right. uh, and that can break. Can it? Yeah. Uh, what if you wank a lot? Uh, well, if you uh, usually dry humping or. Um, <laughs> Or having kind of sex and it's not quite lubricated. Oh, that sounds important. Has that happened to you a lot? No, it's not happened to me, but it's happened to quite a lot of people. <laughs> okay. So it's, uh, uh, you know, but people feel that... Yes, well, you're right, though. You're right in that one of the things about this show, that I, I, I've got a very particular family experience, and no one has had that family experience, and it's very detailed in the show about exactly how my mum had this affair and also about my dad's specific type of dementia. My dad has a type of dementia called Pick's disease, and the thing about Pick's disease, some of the audience may know this, but it's a fronto temporal dementia, and it, the symptoms of Pick's disease include obscenity, mood swings, irritation, bursts of anger. And when the neurologist first told me this list of symptoms about my dad, I said, sorry, does he have a disease or have you just met him? Because <laughs> my dad was always like that. And so the show is really about those two things. It's about sort of how you remember people and how someone who hasn't got any memory can still be himself. And what I noticed was the people who hadn't had those experiences would still want to come and tell me about their family experiences, yeah, yeah. even if they were completely different. Yeah. I think just because... I mean, maybe it is because we're repressed in the United Kingdom, or maybe it's just, you know, people... You, you feel like those things are shameful. You know, that's the normal reaction, I suppose, isn't it? To think, oh, my, my mum's had an affair with someone. I should be ashamed of it. Yeah, but that's odd, because she should be ashamed <laughs> of it. <laughs> she should be ashamed of it. <laughs> I'm not ashamed no. of it at all. But, you know... I'm, no, I'm but actually, I'm not ashamed of it for her as well. No, the no. show is a celebration I'm, I'm, of, of how mental my parents were and how, and how they were the worst parents in the world. It's and a celebration it of that. <laughs> it is. It's it, a celebration. I think that generation of parents, because I grew up in the 60s and 70s, I think they did not have the word parenting. 
That's what they didn't have. I'll give you an example. I mean, this is rather, I don't want to give away everything that happens in my show, but one of the things that happens in my show, that this bloke's name, who my mum had an affair with, was called David. And this led to a number of problems. One of the problems was I talk about listening to my parents having sex... Uh, you know, not like in a really horrible way. I was just next door and <laughs> awake. And, uh, and one time my mum was on her own uh, and she's masturbating. I talk about this in the show and that's fine in and of itself. I don't judge her for that. But at the end of it, she shouted three times the word David. <laughs> now that was confusing for me, right? But it was confusing for me. I was thinking about going next door and going, yes, what? How the hell? But, but the point about it is, and I didn't say this in the show, that's, that's from the show, but I didn't say this in the show, which is, I think that shows at some level the difference between parents then and parents now. Because I have a child, for example, my daughter is called Dolly. Now, in the unlikely event that I was having an affair with someone called Dolly and then masturbating whilst thinking about this woman, I don't think, I think I would at least restrain myself from shouting out three times the word Dolly. I think I'd really think about that before I did that. Your, your daughter's called Phoebe, isn't she? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you interested in anyone else called Phoebe? <laughs> no. Phoebe from uh, Goodnight Sweetheart, but yeah. that's the character. <laughs> uh, that's, that's why we called her Phoebe. Yeah. <laughs> Did you really? No. Okay. <laughs> my wife only realised, I, 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 in my, the sitcom I'm writing about uh, alternate Because you're uh, obsessed universes. with Goodnight Sweetheart. Oh, yeah, well, I, I, thought, I, I, I named the characters in it Gary and Phoebe after, after the characters in Goodnight Sweetheart. I think I wrote it before... I think I had the idea before that my, we'd called our Phoebe Phoebe. And then my wife said, I don't like you calling the character Phoebe because it's like, it feels like... You've... And then yeah. I realised it would be better to call her Yvonne anyway because Yvonne is, the, is actually Gary's uh, wife in the present day. So it made more sense to change the name anyway. Yeah. There's a little bit of behind the scenes for that sitcom <laughs> that you'll probably never see because it's almost certain never to happen. Uh, I, you know, it's, I, I, Did you actually watch Goodnight Sweetheart? Yeah, I watched it all the way through. I'm not probably up the, the, a bit when it was on, but then I became obsessed with it when it was repeated on ITV3. <laughs> partly because you go, why is this on ITV? This was a BBC show. Yeah, What's going on? Yeah, that's, 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 is that like time travel? That, yeah, that time travel to a different commission. Yeah. That's amazing. And then it was on at like four o'clock in the afternoon or something when I was, was always asleep, When you were asleep. Yeah, when I wouldn't <laughs> know. In those days I was awake. And I would always watch it when I was meant to be writing. And I, I came up with various ideas, and one of the ideas was the idea of a writer who was trying to write sitcoms but not getting anywhere, right. becoming obsessed with the f sitcom Goodnight Sweetheart, <laughs> and then going to the Goodnight Sweetheart, the passageway, going through it, and then finding himself on the set of Goodnight Sweetheart That's in the 1990s. Yeah, it's a bit meta. And then, <laughs> Just uh, a touch. And then being able to write the scripts of Goodnight Sweetheart because he had all the DVDs of Goodnight Sweetheart. <laughs> that would be a terrible <laughs> It's very funny, very funny, but it would be a terrible thing to do if you had the power to go back in time and you thought, I know what I'll do with this. Yeah. I'll write fucking good night, sweetheart. That would be but awful. But what does Gary because Sparrow do? That's the point. So he's very critical of Gary Sparrow. When Hang on, now, who's that? Is that Rodney? Yeah, Rodney, yeah. <laughs> Rodney. So he's very critical of Gary Sparrow for going back and exactly what you're saying. Why would you have packed time travel and then just go back? and get off with the first barmaid you've ever seen in the first pub, not even go to the yeah. second pub. I imagine check. because I couldn't bother to build another exactly. set. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so then, ironically, having said that, he goes back and does the same thing himself and realises, you know, and then how much does it affect? Right. It's not going to happen, David. It was a stupid idea, but it got as far as me meeting Marx or Graham uh, right. to discuss it. All right. One how of the two. How were they? Uh, well, it was one of them, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it was nice. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. Um... Uh, well, yeah, it's. Uh, well, we, uh, maybe come back to. We might come back to talking about my family. It's, I, I think as a comedian, it's very interesting to I'm see. I'm doing it in Montreal, actually. Yeah, I'm doing you're... it at the Montreal Com Comedy Festival. I'm touring next year with it, and I'm doing it in Montreal. And uh, I'm looking forward to Montreal, but I. You know, the show isn't, you know, UK specific. But even that thing that I've just told you about my mum and masturbating, I sort of think, will Canadians be all right with that? They do. do you know what I mean? They like, do masturbate. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> What, even Justin Trudeau? <laughs> yeah, he does. That with his not. lovely face. <laughs> I can't believe it. He's the only Canadian I can think of. There must be others. Neil Young. He probably equality, needs. equality, <laughs> equality is his call. Oh, blimey. That's, that's, that's extraordinary. Thank you. Yeah. It's your banjo string, all right? <laughs> Just that, that yeah. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful show, and uh, and I think the things that the, that comes across is that I think with, with families you sort of, there's that. The honesty you have between the actual family members, you know, it's both honesty and dishonesty, but the, you, when you're in that group, you know each other are crazy and you know each other's foibles. And stuff. Yes. And so it, the, every family's like that. So I think even though you're, you know, you're admitting kind of yeah. other people's secrets as well. Which it's mainly other people. It's sort yeah. of weird. But it's, yeah, it's, but it's, it's weird. It's, it's really interesting. It is other people's stuff. And 
you know, although I think someone said to me about the show, said, I think it's okay because I think a child or a son or whatever has copyright over their parents' lives. Yeah. I don't know. Do we think that's true? I mean, are there parents in the, here? Or I think you do, don't you? I think you, uh, certainly uh, my mum's dead and yeah. I am very much not a believer in an afterlife. So I kind of think it doesn't make any difference. With my dad my, still being alive and having dementia, that's more complicated. And yeah. I sort of try and deal with that in the show. And it leads to a bit that I think is actually more moving than it is funny because I think I try to complicate the idea of my dad and who he actually was. Uh, but I do think that when you try and make sense of your own life as a comedian or a writer or whatever, you have to be able to talk about what your parents were like in truth, otherwise you get nowhere. Yeah, and it's true. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people wait until their parents are dead or yeah. uh, to, to, to talk about it. But it's, I think it's very, it's very much from a place of love. It's a very moving show. It's a very yeah. funny show. And you, you know, you push. Th- I don't again. I don't want to give too much away. Yeah, I don't want to give it but away. You push sort of things, and you uh, very far, and you know, you'll end up making a joke about. Uh, yeah, I won't say what it is, but you know, it's because I don't want to spoil it because it's a brilliant line. But it's, but you know, it, 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 if you took some of those lines out of context, yes. you'd go, that's an incredibly offensive thing. Yeah, no, there's lots of really offensive stuff in here, but it's hopefully, it, well, it, I don't really believe in the concept of offensiveness to be honest. But there is some stuff that pushes. I begin the show by talking about social media and about how on social media now you basically can't make a joke without someone else getting offended, whatever it's about. Uh, they'll find a way of being offended because being offended is a way of turning up the volume on who you are. That's, I think, why most people get offended on social media. They're not actually interested in the joke. or, or the, Sometimes they are, but a lot of time they're not. What they really want to do is just say who they are. For, by, through being angry. Although having said that, I was going to talk about this thing that I happened yeah, yeah, to, talk about to that notice. Uh, I'd already written it down so, in my book. So okay, some of you might have well. seen this because it actually got in the Guardian eventually. But uh, yesterday I um, was talking about um, Glastonbury, and I did a slightly. I did it's a daddish joke really. I did that joke. Uh, Ed Sheeran had just come on, uh, and I wrote on Twitter, "Oh no." Someone's got onto the main stage, or the main act at Glastonbury is being held up because the stage has been invaded by some busker, right? Uh, and see, it didn't go very well here, so there's a dad joke, right? No, and, but then that got, but one person immediately, I mean immediately, wrote, no, no, that is the headline act, it's Ed Sheeran, immediately, right? And that's what happens on Twitter, immediately. And there is a, actually a Twitter, you probably know this, a Twitter feed designed to help you with that called Yes, That's the Joke. And so I sent it to Yes, That's the Joke. But then someone else sent me to a, a woman had written... Hang on, I've just got to find this. You, can you uh, talk amongst yourself? Richard, yeah, you can talk, talk for a bit. I'll talk amongst yourself. So anyway, the oh, woman... Do, 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 oh, fuck. Do, 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 hang on, I've got a Skype connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, someone's no. Skyping me from the afterlife. It's just Fucking Trudeau's going to wank over the, yeah. <laughs> over the internet for you. Yeah. Um, a woman said... Does anyone know about this, what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Well, some, some people don't, some people do. Uh, a woman said uh, that about Barry Gibb that she thought it was a real shame that he didn't have any of his own material and he kept on having to do songs by Boyzone and take that, right? <laughs> better, better joke than mine, I'm, I'm quite clearly. And, uh, so anyway, I can't, I can't find the fucking answer, but immediately, I mean, like, you should go and see it. It's an incredibly long thread. People start saying things like, well, you shouldn't say that because, you know, he's a master. And actually, those songs were by him originally, right? <laughs> and it goes on forever. Yeah, yeah. And she's really brilliant with it. She's very patient with these people. But the, the, I'll, I'll find the really funny one in a minute. But <laughs> what, what I was really interested in was one bloke who said, because she said, no, no, it's a joke, mate. It's a joke. And he went, no, if it was a joke, you'd have indicated it in some way. <laughs> and you know what that fucking means? You know what that means on Twitter? 15 crying, laughing emojis. <laughs> that's what that means. And that's the end of comedy. If that's the only way that people know that it's a joke by putting one of them, we'll have to hold up placards on stage. <laughs> well, there's even someone in one of the threads who's saying, I don't think, you, you know, you're saying that now, but I don't think it was a joke when you wrote it. You know, so, so people yeah. are, try, are trying to cover that. I mean, in the old days, not getting a joke would have been the worst thing. That would have been the most embarrassing thing, that someone made a joke and you didn't get it and you were yeah. an idiot. And now, and now it's sort of almost the, the mainstream is not getting jokes. And the people getting, I think people getting offended by things is, is so bizarre. Because again, when we were kids, there was Mary Whitehouse. And, you know, they were the sort of enemy, weren't they? Not the o'clock news or something would be on or the young yeah. ones would be on and there'd be people complaining. And you'd be going, oh, fuck off. You know, that, this, is, this is our comedy. You know, you, if you don't like it, go away. And with TV, you, maybe it's a bit understandable if people are complaining about stuff. But... Now everyone's sort of Mary Whitehouse. Everyone's trying to get in there and look for the, yeah, the offence in a, in a joke. Yeah. Which is... Well, I think the people who were uh, uh, getting cross with her 
felt they were defending Barry Gibb. Yeah. I don't know if he needs defending <laughs> Barry Gibb, does he? I mean, he's, he's very a, wealthy he's and very happy. He's had a tough time. He's lost both of his brothers. That's true, but yeah, I don't... So I, he shouldn't... He shouldn't I mean, but it's not really mocking well, him, is it? It's like, <laughs> what I noticed about this woman, she's called Rachel Burns. I don't know who she is, who did that joke about, uh, you know, it's a shame Barry Gibb hasn't got more material and has to do stuff by boy's own. When, when people said, no, you don't understand, these, he wrote those songs originally... She did lots of sort of funny deadpan responses, but mainly ended up saying, no, no, it's a joke. What she didn't say, which I thought would be interesting if she had done, was say, what I'm doing is pretending to be stupid. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that happens with comedy, but she never did that, and I yeah. wondered if that would have blown their minds, that idea. <laughs> LAUGHTER I think you're so used to, people are so used to it, and so used to coming in on stuff. I, mean, I had one the other day where, where Matrice May was wearing something like, it looked like a cowl or something you know in one of the pits it looked like she had she was turning into the emperor from star wars and so right. I, I made a joke about you know she's, she's not even hiding it or whatever anymore and someone said yes yeah, just typical comment on a woman's clothing oh, yeah, you know yeah, you kind of yeah, go yeah, yeah. yeah. But no i'm not you know it would have been to not point it out it's not sexist to point out when a woman's wearing something that's ridiculous. well obviously well, well one of the big <laughs> issues is is because th this woman rachel got a lot of people mansplaining to yeah, her yeah. which i think is what happens but then I, I, I sent people to it because I thought it was a very interesting and funny thread and she was being really funny uh, and I said oh uh, anyone who ever wants to make a joke on Twitter just read this thread it's kind of you know cautionary tale right this is what happens when you make a joke on Twitter and, that, and I, one woman said to me no 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 this is what happens when a woman makes a joke <laughs> on Twitter and I thought well no that's not fucking true yeah. I'm sorry I could show you thousands of examples of men making jokes and people not getting them yeah. and getting angry about it yeah yeah, I think it's true. It's, there's a bit of truth in both, I think. In yeah. that I, th I think um, w that men are more likely to jump in. and. Uh, oh, men are more likely to jump in. Well, actually, I, it was, it was, she was getting a bit of both. Yeah. She was I, mean, it's just stu I mean, it's just stupid people, really. Stupid Which, luckily, people. in the world of equality, includes both women and men. Yes, it does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so it, it's sort of interesting as a comedian to have those, those issues, I think, and to be have made to think about it. I think a lot of times on Twitter, I just start writing something and go, oh, I can't be bothered. What? Sometimes, if I'm not in the, if I'm not, I just start writing something and think, someone's not going to get this and it's not, I can't be asked to, to do yeah. it. Sometimes I think I can be asked to do it and I know they're going to do it and I'll set the trap and let it go. Well, sometimes, but, uh, sometimes with that, because I do a lot of, uh, on Twitter and actually in my show as well, using a screen, I do quite a lot of, res of showing responses that people have done to me, trolls, uh, or responses I've done to them. And, and people sometimes say you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't feed the trolls, they say. But I think that's wrong, particularly as a comedian, because I think they're hecklers. Yeah. I think they're hecklers, and I think if you can put them down, that, that's entertaining. I remember once one bloke... Uh, uh, someone had written some, something about how they'd read something about me. Uh, so, and they were doing a nice thing. They'd read this thing, they liked it, whatever. And some bloke immediately wrote, the only thing I want to read about you is your obituary. <laughs> and I wrote back... Stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> and I wrote back, well, at least I'll fucking get one, mate. You see, <laughs> and I think that's a pretty good put down, yeah. you know, and that means that I'm as whatever hurt I feel, and I probably do for a second feel hurt when a troll has a go at me, it immediately goes if I can transform it into material. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's possibly how I feel about my life, <laughs> to be honest. That's possibly what I was even doing with my mum and dad. Yeah. Because they weren't, they were shit parents. I mean, I do love them, and I, I'm pleased in a way that they brought me up in such a damaging way, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't be a comedian if they hadn't have decided to inflict quite a lot of neglect and damage on me and my mum hadn't masturbated and called my name. I definitely... I wouldn't be here. So I'm, pl I'm pleased that well, she that did that. Well, that implies that you can't become a comedian unless that has happened. <laughs> and, uh, that, I don't think that... I'm I sure mean, I think I would have blocked it out. If it I'm sure similar stuff has happened to you. I don't know. I don't... I just really... You know, I don't think I had... My parents were a little bit strict, but not... not they were good parents, I think. I don't think your I think dad I, was a headmaster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a weird experience. Yeah, so maybe at your school you were at. Yeah, yeah. That might. Well, have what do you think? What, uh, uh, no, but it's a good question, Richard. Here, yeah. what is it that made you into a comedian? I really if, like, if not your parents. I really like comedy. I think, and, I, and when I did, I did a show about the headmaster's son looking back at that time to see to see if I could blame my dad for the way I did that. <laughs> and I kind of, in the end, I just thought, well, actually, no. Even before I went to that school, I was really obsessed with comedy. I've always been obsessed with sex and comedy, even since I was like, you know, right. a tiny kid. I was. You can't blame your dad for either. No, I can't blame for any of that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know, and I think I was the person I was before 
before that stuff you went through that and I think you can start kind of I don't I think you're t I'm not saying you've done this because I think your stuff the stuff that's happened to you is pretty extraordinary yeah. but I think you can start kind of looking for and I think people do it with their parents so people are very critical of their parents and you've got to get used to that once you're a parent you've got to realise yeah. your kids are going to say oh he did this and this and not not know all about the many hours of love <laughs> and attention yeah. you gave them but it is genuine in my show it's yeah, yeah. genuinely meant to be Here's the stuff they did. It's all very true. It's all very honest. They were they were very mental parents who didn't stop their lives in any way for their children, and their lives were involved, you know, affairs yeah. and hardcore pornography. I found my dad's collection of hardcore pornography when I was seven. I've never stopped really watching and looking at hardcore <laughs> pornography as a result. Yeah. I uh, think you would have done that anyway, though. Yeah, I, well, think, I, would, where I didn't would I find got, my dad's where collection. Where would I have got it when I was seven, though? Where would I have got it? <laughs> well, I would, when you say I would have got it, done it already, where, I think where would I have got it? Regardless of whether you'd seen pornography at seven, I think you as an adult would still be looking no, at yes, hardcore no, pornography. That's absolutely, <laughs> definitely true. But we lost, we've lost the audience, by the way. <laughs> Hardcore pornography is not what it used to be no, it? It is as, not. A, as a subject matter. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I do feel very strongly that because I'm essentially happy with who I am, that whatever, you know, outside the parenting manual they were, it's not a problem. No, and, and the show is a celebration of that. It is a celebration of them, and it's and it's a show with that's full of love. I think. Yeah, it is. So that that's that's what's overwhelming about it. However yeah. dirty and weird and yeah. strange it gets, yeah, it's about the love that you have for your parents and that they have for you as well. I think. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. I'm sure not so sure about that. But, but well, <laughs> I think they do. But you know, yeah. I think your mum's a, your mum comes as you say at the end. I think your mum would love all of this. Oh stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. My mum would just because she was you know she was you can see from all the clips you use she loves being in the limelight. Yeah, yeah. She loved being on your TV yeah, show. Yeah, absolutely. My mum. One of the things about the show as well is, because people get quite uncomfortable, I start off by talking about my mum and showing all these times that my mum was on TV, uh, like when I did Badil and Skinner Unplanned, she was in the audience and she ended up, we used to have the secretary on Badil and Skinner Unplanned. My mum used to do quite a lot of heckling of me. Uh, she used to come to all my shows. So in some ways, she's like a big old Jewish mum. But in other ways, she wasn't. So she'd come to my shows to be all proud and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but her heckles would be weird anyway, like very <laughs> mummish heckles. Uh, there was this one time when I had a pint of beer on stage and she was in the audience and some lads started egging me on to drink the pint of beer in one go. So I drank the pint of beer in one go. As I put it down, I heard my mum shout out, I hope you've had something to eat tonight. <laughs> So it was a very mummish heckle, but uh, but when she was uh, when she was in the audience, Hot Bodil and Skinner Unplanned, and I show this in the show, uh, there's a point where I'm talking to Frank about the idea of having my mum as the secretary, which was the figure who used to come out of the audience and write stuff on a whiteboard, sort of as a, as part of the show. And at one point, Frank, who's not very keen on that idea because he knew my mum fairly well, uh, <laughs> Frank says, "Look, what are we going to do here? You've, you've, you've put me in a terrible position." Either uh, I, 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 I grant an old lady her dearest wish or the show will be shit, right? And my mum from the audience shouts, it always is, right? <laughs> and so she was like, she was, the reason she did that with my mum is that my mum didn't really care at some level about being proud of me. She was more interested in being in the limelight herself. And yeah. so that's why she would have loved the show. Yeah. I mean, I think she, she was also incredibly proud of this affair. <laughs> she was unbelievably <laughs> proud of having an affair. She would tell everyone here. She'd take you aside and tell everyone here about the affair. My, I've got a little, little footage in the, in the show of my brother. My brother, Ivo, who's also a comedy writer, tells this story about how uh, my mum had a golfing memorabilia stall, and you'll know why she had a golfing memorabilia stall, in Gray's Antique Market, which is near here. And he took his girlfriend to see my mum, who'd never, my mum had never met this girl before, Tracy her name was. And he's talk, she's talking to Ivor, my brother, and suddenly she mentions this bloke, David, David White, his name is, uh, out of nowhere, who she's had an affair with. And she turns to the girlfriend and she says, I've been his mistress for 20 years, and turns back <laughs> to my brother as if she'd not said anything at all, right? And she was constantly doing that. She thought it was glamorous yeah. in a very 70s way. But then you've got that honesty gene I maybe have. from her, so you know, yeah. you've, you're, you're the same. I have, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Although I, I'm not, I hate golf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I haven't picked up everything. Well, she didn't really like golf. She, no, she didn't like golf. <laughs> she liked David White's cock. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. We all like that. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's a brilliant. It's a really, really brilliant show. So you, it's 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 rare to get like I think a stand-up show that 
really hangs together that well and is that brilliantly constructed and works as a sort of... I mean, it works as a theatre piece as well as yeah. a stand-up piece, but it's really funny as well. I really yeah, well, when I started doing stand-up again, because I, I, I was obviously doing stand-up when I was in Newman Abadil, and then I did a solo show in 1997, and I stopped doing it for quite a long time, partly because I was I just burnt out, I think, but also I was having, having children and all that. And then when I came back to do it, I did a show in 2013 called Fame Not the Musical, and that was about fame, but also it wasn't... I was trying not to do just a series of jokes. I was trying to do something that felt like it hung together, yeah. like a story, even if it was a number of different stories that would take you from one place to the other. So even if I had a funny idea about something that wasn't to do with that, I, in, in an old show, I would have put that in, crowbarred it in. In these shows, I don't. I will only put stuff in that feels to me like part of the actual journey you're yeah. on. And in that sense, it's a bit like theatre rather than comedy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the first bit you do about Twitter, all the funny tweets and the reaction, yeah. I mean, it is, it is within the things, but it's also a very solid yeah. opening routine as well. So it works. Yeah. I think it's a really great start, and then you get taken into this world. I, what I find interesting, and because I do a, a, sh a show every year and then throw it away usually. Yeah. Uh, occasionally come back to it a few years later. Are you, you doing a best of? Well, right? I did a best of show this that I've just finished, yeah, so then I'm doing it, but I'll be working, I'm working up a new show now. How does a best of show work? Do well, people you shout out requests? No, they did. <laughs> I did think about doing it because I actually learnt all 12, of my, I did all 12 of my shows in, in their entirety here instead of going to Edinburgh in 2015. What, you mean you did a 12-hour show? No, well, I did them over six weekends. But okay. I did, well, 90 minutes each, so like 20 hours of comedy. Right. So I did learn, relearn all of the stuff. Right. But it, I don't think it would work as a request. I did think about maybe I could have a request thing at the beginning. Yeah. But then some of them require props or, you know, and some of them are just too complex or too long. So you need to work out. Right. If someone goes, do someone like Yogg, do the whole of someone like Yogg, I want the whole 60-minute version, please, not the 20-minute version. Yeah. <laughs> you go, oh, well, that will, that's the end of the show then. Yeah. Uh, so it worked quite well, but it, but I didn't, in a way, you just, I kind of, I thought I'd mix it up a bit, but it, yeah, it, it settled into a, a new show in a way that it made sense as it went along. Although there were, I would make some jokes about what the gears shifting a bit when right. when you go from one thing to the next. But I think it's quite interesting to you. You have taken this show and done this for three years, maybe two. No, or three this years? show for about just over two years. Two I, years. I, I started doing. But it. then you'll be doing it next year as well. So yeah, we'll so it's going to be going on too long. It's, yeah. it's completely <laughs> correct. Yeah, we'll be doing it too long. I don't uh, know if it is too long though, because I think it's. I, I saw it quite early on and then yeah. quite recently. Yeah, and it's changed a lot. Yeah, I do change it, uh, and also it changes a bit depending on what happens. So yeah. my dad's dementia changes. Uh, I've noticed one of the things about dementia is that it's not a solid one thing. You, I think we, we're taught by culture, by films and TV, that dementia is just one thing. It's people with tartan blankets on staring at the wall. It isn't. That's one type of dementia. My dad's type of dementia mainly involves him shouting fuck off over and over again, which is confusing because that's what he did anyway uh, throughout his life. Uh, and, uh, and then that dementia, I don't know if anyone, I did, a sh I did a film called The Trouble With Dad. Anyone see that? It's on Channel 4. Uh, and in that film, one of the things I noticed was, that was shot over about a year, was that my initial sense with my dad that it was quite difficult because he was abusing people and abusing me and whatever that when he became quieter, which was part of the travelling nature of that dementia, I started to not like that. I thought, no, I much prefer him telling me to fuck off, because that's him, that's his energy, that's who he is, that's life. And what I don't want is the complete silence of the other type of dementia. So, uh, I don't, why did I begin to say, oh, I've got fucking dementia, because I've now <laughs> forgotten why I'm saying this. Why, why was I saying that? Do you remember? Um, did you fall asleep? I, I, I was looking at what I was going to say next. Oh, okay. I thought you, you Does anyone know why wrong? I began that thread of thought? No one knows. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, so thank you so much. Thank you so So because the, because the show is about real life, basically, and real life changes, then the show changes to some extent uh, because of that. Um, yeah. But I have been doing it quite a lot. And it's yeah, but, it, but I think that's interesting because it, may, it, it really cements it as... Both the, the show keeps improving, I think, if you keep doing it and you keep yeah. working at it, but also then the reputation of the show keeps yeah. growing, you know what I mean? I think if, you, if you've got a show that's, that people want to see and, yeah. then, and, the, the, and then the word's spreading. Yeah, I mean, although have you ever done a show like... Because I did 10 weeks in the West End yeah. just now, including matinees on Wednesdays and Saturdays, so yeah. that was eight shows a week. And the show was going really well, but to be honest with you, about week seven... I hated myself. <laughs> I thought, I cannot go on stage and say this stuff anymore because the show is very authentic and real. And as a result, just pure repetition made me feel like a twat. Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah. Um, never happens to me, no. It right. it is, no, it, no, I do, and I think I, I went through a period where, I, you know, I, would, I didn't, never did as long a period of any show and that, that intensively. But when I was touring 12, 15 years ago, 
you'd, and if the show didn't start off going really well, I would just go, oh, you know, and I put, if it was an art centre and there was 30 people, then it wasn't going very well, or I was bored with it, I'd just put my head down and yeah. basically say it as quickly as I could. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Can you do a little bit of chat and stand up while I go for a piss? <laughs> Is that I'll all right? Talk about, I'll talk I'm, about quite, this. I'm 53. That's all right. And so I have to do that. You're drunk, well, I've drunk more than you. I've drunk more water than you. All right, you. okay. Fine. You Sorry go. I'll, t- I'll, I'll keep telling the audience I will come this. back. Okay. All right. I can keep talking. Um, so, well... Someone else didn't bother with that and just weed in the seat. I don't know if you can pick that up. There's, there's a big stain on that seat. I didn't want to tell Dave before he sat down on it, but I'm, not, I'm definitely not sitting in that one. Uh... Well, what I've learned as a comedian, that David's going to miss this now, because he's, he's in the toilet, is that you, you, know, you can keep a show uh, interesting for yourself by, by uh, keeping on working on the, uh, the, the way you do it, rather than the words as well. But um, <laughs> David will miss out on that now. Um, I did, uh, I did a, uh, a travelogue show with David Baddiel. Oh, I said his name correct. Thank God he wasn't here to hear it. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> called uh, uh, 48 Hours to Go Broke. Did anyone see that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. Some people did. It was kind of quite a weird idea. We were given like £10,000 and we had to go to uh, Yerevan in uh, uh, Armenia uh, and then we had 48 hours to spend £10,000. I think they made it £8,000 for Armenia because th- it's everything so cheap in Armenia <laughs> that it would be impossible to spend that amount of money. It was quite a weird uh, idea for a show. I might talk to David a deal about now. Here he comes. Oh, it's David, bad deal. How was the week? It's like a round of applause for having a piss. <laughs> uh, it was all right, but I was worried because I'm wearing fairly light trousers, yeah, so I assumed, that, I assumed there'd be a stain. Yeah. I also assumed you were saying something embarrassing about me. No, I wasn't. Now, really. I once did that on Badil and Skinner Unplanned, uh, and Frank told this story. I shouldn't really tell this because it's fairly horrible then, and I'm older now, and I'm going to give you a really disgusting image, but hey, it doesn't matter. It's been on telly. Uh, Frank, I, I went for a piss during the show uh, and Frank told this story uh, to the audience while I wasn't there, I didn't realise he had told it about he'd come round to my house and he'd noticed I'd got a stain on my t-shirt and he said, oh what's that? And I said, I've just been wanky and he said, oh god, are you going to tell me that? I said, no, 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 it's not that bad uh, what was happening was I was wanking and because I was about to have an orgasm, I put my T-shirt in my mouth. And that's what the stain's from, right? So I, 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 offer, I offered that up as like, it's not as bad as you think it is, right? That stain. Anyway, that's the story he told to the audience. And I didn't know when I came back. So I had to work it out for the rest of the show what he told the audience, because he had told them all not to tell me, right? And then right at the end of it, he said, well, why do you do that anyway? Why don't you hold it up with your hand? And I said, well, I, I need my, both my hands, <laughs> obviously. And he couldn't understand why. And I said, amateur. Surely, <laughs> surely you need both your hands. Anyway, I just started going out with Morwenna, my partner, when that show, Now My Wife, was on. And she split up with me uh, briefly because she said I've got to go to the school gate and she wasn't we must have had children already <laughs> yes. and they were, some people will have seen that show and I'm so embarrassed wow. it was only for like a day she came back <laughs> came back but I did realise that, that came that back because you need two hands to masturbate <laughs> yeah. with your cock so that's the reason she came back yeah I, d- I don't need you can't to leave that behind can you I, I don't need two hands to masturbate <laughs> all the time okay. only towards the end okay. yeah <laughs> know what I mean <laughs> You put the other one up your arsehole. <laughs> Ball cradling, a little bit of arsehole, yeah. Okay. I'm 53, it's disgusting me talking like this. <laughs> Do you remember when we went to Armenia? I thought we talked about this, but it happened in between. Um, the we way you to... said that after the wanky story sounds like Armenia is a euphemism. <laughs> Yeah, we went to Armenia. Do you remember uh, to Yerevan? Yes, we went to Yerevan and we did a weird show on Dave that yeah. no one watched. It was a real laugh. Well, th- three people watched it because I was talking about it just now. Mm. It, was, it was good fun. It was a it weird was really concept. It was a, probably the wrong time for that concept to come out. Just well, as, austerity. You yeah, mean. austerity was hitting and then they said, let's send comedians to spend, frivolously spend money in foreign countries. It wasn't countries. that much money though, was it? it because wasn't. we were in Yerevan, it yeah. was like eight grand, which yeah, obviously is grand. not no money, but it doesn't feel like... the the million dollars that you would have in Brewster's Millions yeah, or whatever well, the show the, well was the show's the, based on Brewster's Millions yeah. isn't it well I thought it was quite interesting because essentially it, it, it's although people, some people went oh that's offensive and d- distasteful which I can see but also yeah, but all they hadn't watched Badila Skinner on plan <laughs> 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 I was in the next bedroom to him and he was wanking yeah. with two hands and shouting Richard at the end three times 
don't know where you got that from. It was, it was Dick. It dick, was a bitch. Just dick. dick. Yeah, that's a bitch. <laughs> Um, but you know all of those travelogue shows of sending two men to an interesting place. Well, sometimes, uh, sometimes a woman or hardly two women. Ever. Okay. There was a couple. There was a couple of episodes in the series we did with women. But it's nearly always two men. But, they, they but that's because they're more male comedians. Don't yeah, I, think, I don't think they don't want to send women. Is that what you're saying? I just think it's kind of it's interesting when you look at how many times it is like men. But anyway, okay. Let's not get onto that. But they, but they you're essentially sending someone. If you send Carl Pilkington or whoever to wherever, yeah. they are spending. All that money yes, as yes, they go on yes. a, you know, you're sending Carl Pilkington somewhere that he sensibly doesn't want to go yeah. for a joke, yeah, and then making him do stuff that he doesn't want to do. That still all costs that money, so it yes. was like an upfront TV show. Yeah, but it was uh, actually. I don't, when was when did we do it? Um, it was 2014. Yeah, yeah. I think it was an early example because I could tell you. I don't know if I was aware of it as much, but you were already worried about Twitter. Yes. About how we were going to get slagged off on Twitter. Well, we got for, tweets for the, that. We got tweets on the way to the uh, as we were at the airport. I remember saying that it yeah. made, got mentioned on Chortle, and already some people were going, "Oh God, this is disgusting." This how is disgusting. And acting me in and saying, "How can you do this?" Yeah. And you know, I can sort of say, I think it was an incredibly fun thing to do. It was really fun. A yeah. really interesting thing to do, and it made you think about the value of money. And we were giving the money as much as we could to people we thought would benefit from it. Yeah. Although, Although I did suggest that we went with, we had like a big presidential suite. Yeah. In a hotel that I believe uh, As- uh, uh, yeah. Assad, President Assad of Syria, has stayed in. He just stayed in there the week before, I think. Yeah, he just yeah. stayed there the week before. So there were more things to complain about uh, than just <laughs> us spending money. But we did. Uh, I did say, let's get the, the presidential suite and throw money yes. on it and, uh, and dive around in it in dressing gowns. Yes. Uh, but then the problem was, because it was Armenia, we couldn't get the stuff on the... Uh, uh, room service that we wanted to enact that scene. We wanted essentially to do an ironic, oh, we're so wealthy. So I thought we could get champagne and things like that. All we got, I think, was tiramisu. Yes. That was all we had was a plate of tiramisu well, yeah. as their luxury thing that we basically had <laughs> to each other. Yeah. But we were like, we were only we only spent a certain amount of money on, on stuff on each thing, yeah. and we got the presidential suite. I think for an hour we were allowed yeah, to have and a it. very angry man. Yeah. On and it was service. ridiculous. We think, oh, we're in the presidential suite. Yeah. President asked us, "Can we get some? Can we get some champagne?" Ah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. no, no, no. And we said no. someone in the crew wanted some cigarettes. Have so you got? Can we get some? No. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> They were just furious. <laughs> this isn't furious. the presidential experience I was expecting. No, it was very unpresidential. Um, and we drank uh, coffee that had come out of a cat's anus. Yeah, we did do that. That sounds like we didn't do that, but we did do that. But it, it's that special coffee, you might have heard of it, where a cat eats the coffee bean, yeah. then shits it out, yeah. then they give it to you. Yeah, <laughs> then you drink it. Then you drink it. <laughs> I am sophisticated. Yeah. And there's a lot of things about being rich, which is just everyone taking the piss out of you for me. You're rich, you have to drink this cat bum coffee. Mm, yeah. And yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's It smells delicious. of cat shit. Yeah. It costs so much, it must be good. Yes, you well done. Thank yeah. you for the money. Yeah. Uh, and then they themselves become rich and then they have to drink cat bum coffee. It's yeah. a terrible spiral of cat bum yeah. coffee. Actually, I think that cat shit coffee just tasted of coffee. <laughs> it didn't even taste of cat shit. You'd want it a little bit to taste of cat shit, but it didn't. That was the real swizz. <laughs> I thought what was most interesting, and I think there's a TV show in this, is we went to, we were allowed to do, go to a casino. Yes. And I play roulette quite a lot. So, I so we were trying to lose money. That was the idea. And the, yeah, so it was very exciting to go to a casino and put money in there. They would only let us, I wanted to put it all on one number. Yeah. And then they wouldn't let us do it because it was too big an amount of money if we won. Oh, right. Was that uh, right? Yeah, I so remember. we had to put it on two numbers, which are, that made me nervous. Because yeah. I thought, now it's 17 to 1. Well, presumably, because the idea of this show, just to reiterate, I know Richard said, is that you have to get rid of all the money. Now, if we'd won an enormous amount of money, we'd still be there, I assume. <laughs> you have to live in Armenia for the rest of your life, well, <laughs> spending that money very slowly. I think the producer did say, you know, if you did win on that tape, we could always retake it yeah, yeah, and yeah. just all split the money and pretend it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe that's, that's what happened yeah, here. That's happened, Cat yeah. bum coffee. <laughs> 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 but it was incredibly exciting. I think there might, you know, I think there's a game in this somehow. It was actually more nerve wracking. I play roulette quite a lot, just casually, every now and again for fun. And it's a stupid game to play. Don't play it because you can't really win. But the, we came very close. We were like one or two 
slots away from winning on one of our numbers. Yeah, and the, and to, to see it come it was around, exciting. it was very exciting and nerve-wracking. And when you're trying to lose the money to the danger yeah. of suddenly winning, yeah. Yeah. it was a, a very yeah. odd experience. It's a very weird place as well, year around. Yes, yeah. It's really weird. And there was a slight sense that if we had won, erroneously, we might be dead anyway. Because <laughs> yes. there's a lot of gangsters around. And Well, it's quite unusual for a casino to refuse. I mean, I know it was... But it wasn't like a huge, it was like a thousand pounds or something. It wasn't like a huge, uh, maybe eight hundred pounds. That we'd we bet. To put on we here, bet. We bet eight hundred pounds. Eight hundred pounds on two numbers, but even eight hundred pounds, you know, We're for a casino, eight hundred pounds times thirty-five is not a massive amount of. We money. are talking a lot about a show that no fucker has I know, seen. It was interesting, though. <laughs> it was an interesting show to be part of, and you know, I, who else I was, did the show? I was on telly, wasn't it? Yeah, you were on telly. That's true. That was quite unusual. Uh, Susan Cowman did it with, I think, Freddie Flintoff or someone like right. that. I okay. can't remember who the other people. I mean, I don't think it did well because you know people were just laughing at the idea of Susan Cowman <laughs> and Freddie Flintoff. They were in Iceland. They, 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 they went up a mountain. I think she told me they went up like a mountain, and nearly died or something. It sounded much worse. Their version. Well, how, how do you and spend money? How do you spend, you spend money up I a think mountain? They went to a hang gliding or something like that. Oh. Well, that sounds much easier. Yeah. We dressed up in opera costumes and danced around. We did around. do that, yeah. We did do that. And then we just ended up giving money away, didn't we, at the end? Yeah. yeah. That's kind buying, of an easy way of doing it. Buying stuff from yeah. street vendors and things. Anyway. It was, nice. it was nice. We had a lot of fun. Do you have questions from the audience? No, I've got questions from my book, though. Okay. It's got an emergency question. Was there a catchphrase bit at the start? Yeah. What was that? It's, it's, got to be one of the cool kids, David, if you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You're not in. I want to know what the catchphrase is. You just have to say Rahula Stipper. Rahula Ah, right. Uh, it's like, it's like yeah, Cracker Jack. <laughs> see, uh, see how soon they forget. Um, question 478, if you're following along at home. <laughs> That's like a vicar. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I think this will be a homely text one day. Yeah. When this is discovered. Did you say that's the one that costs a lot of money? Uh, you can buy, uh, some of them on eBay have gone for like, because I've, I've written extra questions in the front and signed them and stuff. And it's gone a little bit crazy. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking of giving up the podcast and just doing the books. Really? Yeah. How much do they sell for? The, it's like Harry each. Potter. Ten pounds each. Oh but right. yeah, the ten pounds, and then it's a first edition. Yeah. So, you know, you could, it's very like Harry Potter. There will be movies of this. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be the first movie. And this will be one of the scenes in the movie, David. Question so the emergency four. question yeah. is an idea that you had separate to the podcast. Well, it's sort of part of the podcast. When I was interviewing Jonathan Ross, I got a bit flummoxed and couldn't think of anything to say to him. Right. And wished I had some questions written down. That right. I could Because that's what to. he does yeah. on his show. <laughs> so he thought, yeah, down. I'll take a leaf out of his book. <laughs> so yeah. I'd write some down for the next person. Okay. So this is one I don't think I might have asked this to someone else. 478. If you had to have sex with either Zippy, Bungle, George, Jeffrey, or Rod, <laughs> whilst Jane and Freddie had sex with each other next to you, but you couldn't join in with that bit, yeah. if you had to, yeah. which of the Rainbow Crew would you have sex with out of those? Sorry? Zip, someone very keen on Zippy there. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, as far as Rainbow goes, yeah. uh, which is quite a 70s reference yes. point, uh, I can only really remember Bungle. Right, well, you could, he's in there. Is he the bear? Yeah. Oh, no, no, Zippy. Zippy's Zippy, the Zippy one. Well, yeah, well, obviously, Zippy's got the zip on his mouth. Yeah, but if you get your cock caught Yeah, so that's bit. the whole point. It could be quite erotic, unzipping the mouth. <laughs> that be. And then laying your cock on the felt. <laughs> and then, you know, the bloke. Who's the bloke? Jay. No, no, that's not oh, the bloke. Oh, Jeffrey. Freddy. Jeffrey. Well, Jeffrey's sticking his finger up your ass, and then you hope for the best. <laughs> It was never like that, Rainbow. It was. When I watched it. Well, but weirdly, though, Rod, Rod Jane and Freddy... Uh, were Rod, they on Rainbow? Yeah, they were the singing group, Rod, right. Jane and Freddy. And but it sounds like swingers. Well, they, well one, if Jane you were, if, was if, married to Rod, and then and there was a different person in Rod, Jane and Freddy. He was called something else. George, I can't remember what he's called now. And then, there was a different person in Rod, Jane and Freddy <laughs> who wasn't called Rod, was Jane called, or Freddy. No. Well, but that it, must have never worked. <laughs> then they said, let's get someone called yeah, Freddy yeah. in. Okay. And then Freddy <laughs> came in. Yeah. And then Freddy and Jane are now married to each other. Are they? Yeah, so they, she was with Rod and then she left Rod and she went with Freddy, but they all still work together. So I think, the, very, I think they'd be up for this. The Crankies actually are swingers, did you know that? Yes. Okay. Did you know that? The Crankies actually are swingers. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a big sort of news story in the sun, uh, but then it sort of, I don't know what happened to it, because I would have thought that should be more well known, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, well, It's like an unbelievable thing. Could you imagine? I mean, I, I've never done swinging, and I'm an honest person, and you would know, I would definitely tell you if I'd been to a swingers party, so I'm not. 
But I imagine that if you went to a swingers party, even though when I've watched documentaries, it's virtually always men with moustaches who live off the A1, right? <laughs> even though it's really kind of unsavoury people, you'd still be disappointed if you open the door and it's the crankies. <laughs> or, or you'd be overjoyed. One of the two, it's hard to know. The story I had, and I can't quite remember all the details apart the punchline of it, was right. that... that, that, uh, that <laughs> I've got Roger Jeanette, Jeanette. Jeanette. Jeanette Cranky was having sex with like two guys or something in a dressing room. She's not big enough. And then um, <laughs> someone walked into the room and Jeanette Cranky said, Oh, you must think I'm a terrible flirt. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that story a million times yeah. about other people. Yeah. I've never heard it about Jeanette Cranky. But yeah, I have heard that story. I'm sure it's not true. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll ask you the next question as well. If you didn't have to have sex with the Zippy, Bungle, Geoff, Jeffrey and George, it's about sex. Okay. It's about not having sex. If you didn't have to have sex with the Zippy, Bungle, George, Jeffrey or Rod, but not Jane or Freddie who would now be asleep, but they said they were up for it if you fancied it, but not an orgy situation, it would have to be one-on-one, -on -one. would you have sex with one of them and which one? <laughs> I haven't, don't have I, I haven't understood the question. <laughs> I, I, not that I haven't understood the question because it's too out there. It's too long. I just lost any sense you of what you were saying. To, you don't have to have sex with them now, but they said what they say. You can we're if prepared you like. to have sex with one of us on a one-on-one -on -one, non-orgy situation. Still Would zippy. You? <laughs> still zippy. Still unzipping his mouth. Still putting my cock on his felt. Still Jeffrey putting his finger up my ass. So it's the same answer as before. I refer the right honourable gentleman to my previous answer. <laughs> So, you're writing kids' books now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. They're very successful. <laughs> they were very successful until this podcast. They were doing excellently. It's um, a problem, actually. It is a bit of a problem, because as a comedian, I am, uh, you know, fairly adult. Uh, and then every so often, I will get someone who, you know, only really knows me from the kids' books, yeah. saying, is it all right if I bring my nine-year-old <laughs> to the show or whatever, or to this? Yes. And I would say, no, they'll be traumatised for life, like <laughs> I was by my mum shouting my name when she was wanking. And yeah. Although that's done me no harm, <laughs> I, can't, I can't guarantee the same for your son. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bit of a thing. Yeah. You, you, but you've got children now. I've got a, a child and another one on the way. They don't read yet. Not. To There's quite a lot of... Uh, comedians and people in the public eye writing children's books. There are. Well, it's a, my, my wife is a children's author. Oh, right. Well, there you go. Uh, so children's authors are generally quite annoyed. Although my wife w was also a stand-up comedian, but yeah. not... not in the, no, I know not children's not. authors are a bit annoyed about it. Yeah, children's authors are uh, annoyed. That, so I went to a party with my wife at the, the, her publishers, and everyone was going, are you going to write a children's book now? I said, yeah, I might do. This sounds like quite a bit of fun. Would your, would your wife be annoyed if you write a I think. Well, I think it would be weird. I think it, she would find it odd if I suddenly went. And I've actually always... I wouldn't do it part because I wouldn't want to feel like, oh, it's another comedian writing a book yeah. and joining this bandwagon. That I, mean, I think, again, you were ahead of the bandwagon. Well, th to be honest, David Williams was the one yeah. who started it, uh, but then I was probably the next one, and now everyone. Well, every, Spike every Milligan fucking... was maybe the one who well, started it. Well, Spike Milligan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pakun. <laughs> like, he, well, he did lots of little poem, poetry books and stuff. Yeah. I just love Spike Milligan as, yeah. as a kid. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, but it's, I think it makes sense for comedians to write books because kids like funny books and comedians yeah. Are childish. So I, yeah. I've, got, I've got lots of ideas for children's books. No, but books. that's true, though. That is true. Is that uh, I only once was going to write one. Uh, I, I wrote a book called The Parent Agency, and I wrote that because my son said to me when he was eight, he said, Dad, why does Harry Potter, why doesn't he run away from the Dursleys and go and find some better parents? And that gave me an idea, which was about a world where children can choose their own parents. And what I noticed when I wrote that book is that I decided to write it more or less as I would write any other thing, which is to try and make it as funny as possible, but leave out the stuff about Jeffrey putting his finger <laughs> up my ass. <laughs> By which I mean leave out the sex and the swearing. Well, it's got yeah. swearing in it, actually, but leave out most of the higher, harder sex and swearing. <laughs> and that was quite successful because I believe, I don't know how many people in this audience have got kids, but I believe that things have changed with comedy since I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, uh, you know, it was basically the magic roundabout. That was yeah. children's television. Now, my son has grown up on The Simpsons and Amazing World of Gumball, which is the funniest show on television. I don't know if anyone watches it, but on Cartoon Network, there's a show called Amazing World of Gumball, which is not the funniest show on television for kids. It's the funniest show on television, okay. full stop. And I think there's a space now called for children, but it's not really for children because children are more sophisticated and adults are more childlike. Yes. And so as a result, I think you can do stuff in the for children space as a comedian, which isn't really talking down in any way yeah. to kids. You just leave out the swearing. Sure. I guess your books aren't really the kind that 
the kids are a bit older, they're not getting read to by their parents. Nine so much. to twelve year olds. Yeah. That is the, that's, that's the demographic. Yeah. Really. So they'll be reading themselves. Yeah, but, it, but it's, yeah, but it's fun as an adult when you get stuff that, that you know is funny for you as well as for the kids. So like, I was watching uh, Monsters Inc. 15 times in a day with my daughter the other day. Yeah. And it's when it bears watching 15 times, it's really good. I've seen Cars, <laughs> they don't watch it, but I've seen Cars, the Pixar film, about 50 times. Has anyone seen Cars, the Pixar film? Okay, do you know what happens when Lightning McQueen has the spotlight put on him? Does anyone, does anyone know what I'm talking about at all? Okay, there's a bit, this is going to go nowhere, but I must, I want to get it off my chest, right? Lightning McQueen, who is the main car in Cars, there's one bit where he's won a race and he's about to get an award and a spotlight comes on him and he's there and he doesn't know what to say and in the distance, very carefully, you only know this if you've seen it 50 times, you hear someone shout, free bird. Right? Now that is from Leonard Skinner's One More From The Road, their double live album released in 1976. And you hear that very in the background when someone wants them to play Freebird. And I know that that happens in cars yeah. because I've seen it 50 times. But I may be the only person in the world who knows that that happens in cars. But Does anyone else know that? No, that's pretty good. Or it doesn't want to know it. No one wants to know it either. But that's, you know, that's what's... When, when they bothered... To go that deep with yeah. these things and I think it really works for kids films because they, they really make the kids stuff I think are very clever I think was, we were talking about CBs, CBBs the other week yeah. and Postman Pat and the way that as a parent you'll pick up on all the ridiculous stuff in Postman Pat but the people who write that know that Yes. You're, the, the parents are going to watch it. Go, oh, how does he afford all these different vehicles and yeah. why? Blah, blah blah. You know, they know what's going to happen. Yeah. But they also know that will give the parents pleasure to do that. So yeah. they don't sign it up at all. But they let they let all those things. And with an occasional, they go, oh, why, where's Pat? He's always it's not very unusual for him to be late. His wife says, and everyone else goes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just really. You say that, that he's a swinger. Is that no, what you're saying? He's, he's always. He never delivers anything on time. He's always. I don't want to go into it again, David. Okay. <laughs> I've done it. Yeah, I've, you've you've, I've, you've I've spoiled children's anger. television for all of us. <laughs> um, I, I want to do. Uh, there's two dirty Britcom confessions about you. Have you seen the dirty? Dirty Britcom Brit confession. Brit, dirty Britcom confessions is a website where people can put their sexual. Is it fan fiction? Yeah, it's where fans can say what they would like to do to you, uh, comedians, not yeah. just you sexually. Yeah, I've, I've read. I haven't read it. <laughs> I, I've seen some fiction yeah. about me and various of my double act partners. Yeah, it is, there's a where lot we, of where we get it together. Yeah, uh, weirdly, there isn't any of that with with. You and Stuart Lee. Conquer. No, there is loads of me and Stuart Lee. Oh, there is. Well, yeah. don't get don't get big about it. <laughs> loads. <laughs> it sounds terrible and creepy. <laughs> we did. Oh, quite we, a lot. I've got much more of me wanking off Stuart Lee <laughs> than you wanking off Frank Skinner. Yes, well done. <laughs> um, the, here you've got two for you. I'm going to read them. They're not uh, they're not uh, that uh, racy, but I'm quite interested. Just interested to see what you think. But they are quite racist. All, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate all Jews. Yeah. Except David Bedir. David Bedir. Is I would circumcised love to penis. <laughs> <laughs> Has he got a banjo <laughs> string? Who knows? <laughs> read it, read it <laughs> out. <laughs> All I want is to feel David Baddiel's beard between my thighs. Why is that too much to ask? <laughs> You're sincerely Jeanette Cranky. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be prepared? I mean, you could just send them your beard. That's the nice thing. If you can, yeah. you could shave off your beard. Yeah. Say, um, stick this between your thighs. I want to know whether... Is it a woman, first? Well, you know, you I mean, just sexist. No, I don't mean to be uh, sexist or anything, but I, what I'm interested in is if it is a woman, whether or not she herself is quite hairy yeah. down there. And that's why she... If she's not, yeah. whether that's why she wants it. Because it's quite fashionable <laughs> now to, uh, on, on the on pornography on the web, which as you know I watch. Uh, there's some very big stuff uh, with sites now for hairy women, right. and it might be just someone who thinks, well, I can't get enough hair yeah. down there. What about using David's beard? Yeah, it might be that. But it might be someone who wants to create static electricity, and they've got plenty of hair, but they think my hair and that hair. Yeah, we could power <laughs> the <laughs> national <laughs> grid together. <laughs> If uh, I was moving, I guess. And uh, the other one's just quite sweet. Yeah. Um, I that want one, that to one was quite sweet. Uh, yeah, well, they're both sweet compared to what... Uh, what you can get. Uh, I want to run my fingers through David Baddiel's hair. Is that it? Yeah. Beard hair or pubic hair? I mean, I think just hair. <laughs> really? Yeah. No, that's not, that's not very... No, I, I mean, that's weak for, the, for yeah. the... Surely it could be more erotic. What about stuff about you and Stuart Lee? Or is it not about you and Stuart Lee? Um, is I it about you and other people that you've associated usually with? Usually if it's a double... I can't remember the... the uh, we're going to look it up later together. <laughs> I want it to be... i pick up my shirt. I want it to be... <laughs> Now, you see, that was disgusting for other reasons, I'm afraid. It wasn't the wacky that was disgusting about that. Um, 
I think, I've got to be honest with you, that if people are writing fan fiction about you and Stuart Lee, yeah. he's going to be the dominant one, isn't he? <laughs> it's going to be you sucking him off, mainly, and him saying... He just him, thought he, a lot about this, <laughs> David. And, and him counting his BAFTAs. It's going to be, that's what it's going to be. <laughs> and someone wanking at the thought of yeah. that. Yeah. Don't you think? I think I would have thought so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't how it went down in reality, though. So, um, what does that even mean? <laughs> uh, what was the? I never heard sort of saw this, but I have a question about which is your favourite McWhirter twin. But you did a show called the Norris McWhirter Chronicles. Yeah, well, I did not a show. I did a short what was film it? for Sky about Norris McWhirter. Now, I'll tell you the story. This is I, I've always liked this story, but it's a very strange story which is anyone who doesn't know, which is, I'm sure there are people too young in this audience, uh, which is that Norris McWhirter was on a show called Record Breakers. Uh, and he was, Record Breakers was a show in the 70s that Roy Castle used to do. We ref I referenced it right at the top yeah, of the show. Yeah, I heard you mentioning Roy yeah. Castle. Uh, and it was basically a show about the Guinness Book of Records and about, you know, who's the fastest man in the world or whatever at the time. Uh, and they used to do little skits and little things about that. And I used to like it quite a lot. And then Norris McWhirter, who was the kind of oracle of all this, he knew the Guinness Book of Records by heart, came to my school, this is a completely true story, to do a talk. And I was very excited about this. And the place was packed, the assembly hall was packed because he was quite a big star at the time. It then turned out, and I didn't know this, obviously when I was 12 or 13, that Norris McWhirter was the member of something called the Freedom Association, which was a kind of quite right-wing organisation, very right-wing organisation, and he come to talk about how much he was pro-apartheid, how much he hated the trade unions, and how much you know the Labour Party were trying to ruin the country and whatever. And he put up a big sign that just said freedom on it. So he talked for about half an hour about this. And I remember sitting there thinking, OK, this is really boring, but I'm also worried about something, which is he's going to ask for questions. And people here, they're going to ignore what he said, and they're just going to say, what's the biggest fish? Right? <laughs> And I got really worried about that. I thought that would be really embarrassing because he hasn't even mentioned Record Breakers or Roy Castle. And I was worried about that throughout. And this is what actually happened. He finished his talk, which was all about this very right-wing stuff, very serious. And then he said, are there any questions? And a bloke put his hand up and he said, what will houses look like in the year 2000? <laughs> and I thought, well, that's nothing to do with what he's talking about. And there's nothing to do with Record Breakers. What the fuck? Right? And he answered it. He answered it. He said, I think we'll all live in yurts. <laughs> so I did a short film about that. And I can't, there was, in fact, a coda to that story, unbelievably. There is a coda to that story, which is many, many years later. I was driving in Birmingham with Frank Skinner. We were on our way. We did some filming. And uh, the much older Norris McWhirter was on a show, uh, a radio show, answering questions about records. And people would ring up and they would try and catch him out. And you could win a copy of the Guinness Book of Records if he couldn't answer, you on know... The on the radio. On the radio. Well, he, yeah, well, yes, the <laughs> he could have been cheating. <laughs> he could have been cheating. That's true. That's true. But <laughs> the premise was, he was on some local Birmingham radio station. You ring up, you say, who's the tallest man in the world? If he can't answer, you get a free book. <laughs> so, I did you not know that one? It's the, he's in the front of the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> that's what happened. Okay. Anyway... He, uh, so th this show, this is going on for about 20 minutes, and I'm listening to it and thinking, oh, this is sort of what I expected to happen, right? <laughs> then, right at the end of it, someone rings up and says, what's the biggest ant in the world? And <laughs> Norris answers that completely confidently, and he says, oh, it's the killer ant of the Australian, who sometimes can be six inches long, and his bite is this and that. Goes on for ages. And then he's really happy, thinking no one's run the book. And then the bloke goes, no, it's the elephant. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Norris gets really angry and says, well, that's just stupid. <laughs> and then he goes, no, 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 give me the book. I've won a book. And he goes, no, cut him off. <laughs> so you can see that, what I've just told you, enacted on the Norris McWhirter Chronicle. It's available on YouTube, and I did it. And what was, what was also ridiculous about that was Sky did this thing called Christmas Crackers, and they were asking people to do autobiographical films. So I did that. I just recreated that whole story that I've just told you. What I didn't realise is they were called Christmas crackers. They were meant to be Christmas stories. <laughs> it had nothing to do with Christmas. So just at the end of it, I say Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's it. We get to nice murder. What was the best Christmas? Yeah. It was the first Christmas. <laughs> the, first it was the one with Jesus, Jesus. and his birthday. Jesus.
It should have been. He should have had freedom, except for Nelson Mandela on his yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, don't free Nelson Mandela. Do you remember that song he did with the specials? <laughs> Imagine if he'd done that. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. He's got angry about the free yeah. don't, don't free him. No, I don't like him. History would have he'd have been on the wrong side of history, yeah. and he was wrong about the Yurts as well. I don't trust that. Was wrong, that's the thing. He was wrong about that too. Because we live in the same houses as we did then. <laughs> Oh dear, good. It's time to go. It is time to go. I think, unfortunately, there's a lot more to talk to you about, but we'll have you back in another I've five really years. I've really enjoyed it, yeah, five years. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. I'm Ladies and go. gentlemen, it's David Baddiel. Thank you. We'll be back in the second half for the next week's show. Don't tell me. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>